I'm Jan English Lewitt. This YouTube video series profiles workplace anthropologists whose work directly influence their own workplace processes. The video series is part of a workshop in the Business Anthropology Matters Initiative. As people increasingly spend their waking hours at workplaces, anthropologists need to understand those experiences. The practitioners profiled here have used anthropological skills to access, document, analyze, and relate the lives of workers and the businesses that employ them. Organizations employ anthropologists to understand a variety of worker-related issues within organizations, ranging from design to strategy. These interviews explore the practical, theoretical, and ethical issues that must be resolved to do workplace anthropology. In my current work, of course, is as a workplace anthropologist working in design. Of course, I've done applied anthropology and program evaluation in First Nation communities. And also, of course, I've used anthropology as an archaeologist as well. For, for So it's, I've had it in a few areas I've done it. But I, when I did my PhD at the University of Toronto, I did it in archaeology and anthropology. I was interested in indigenous peoples. And then when I finished that in 2001, uh, I applied for work uh, as a consultant doing historical research on residential schools. And then from there, I met people who then opened me up to opportunities to volunteer to do program evaluation, online claims for Indigenous peoples, doing field work in the remote north, northern Canada. Uh, and that led to other opportunities to do research on everything from marketing to job programs to, and then further archaeological um, uh, work to help do clearances for heritage for. Um, businesses that are developing land in Ontario. Uh, and those experiences, of course, happened because people asked, can you do this? And I would apply and then I would, you know, build that up. And I had my own business running this, these sorts of operations. So the anthropology side was program evaluation. The archaeology side was doing heritage assessments uh, for companies uh, that want to develop land, like um, housing developments and the like. And then uh, I started to be interested in design because I've taught as a sessional at Carleton University for a long time in anthropology. I taught a course, a third year course I still teach in design called Context of the Product, which looks at the human side of design. And they said to me, well, you should do a master's of design. You'd be a natural for it. So I went back to school and it was there that I had a great experience learning about design. And then I met Ryan Hum, who was then working for the Innovation Hub. And he said, you know, we use design for service design. And that was my first exposure to it. And I realized it wasn't just about making physical products, but also services. And suddenly I saw a place where my anthropology and my other experiences might come into one place. And when he asked me to join his team at Immigration Canada, uh, IRCC, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada now, um, I jumped at the chance and uh, I've been working there uh, for the past several months and really enjoying the work. Well, right now I work, my formal title is in government, in gov Canadian government speak, uh, I'm, I'm in project administration, but my title is strategic advisor, design anthropologist. So the work that I do um, is basically I work with a multidisciplinary team, which I'll describe uh, when we get to that question. Um, and what I do is that I help support providing the I like to call it connecting the dots. So looking at the broader perspectives of things. So when we're looking at design for services, sometimes I bring in those anthropological concepts to explain how things change. I do a lot of research, academic research and other types of research and bring it to the table. Uh, and then I also participate, of course, in the actual work of doing design. So everything from doing the journey mapping, uh, do, uh, doing the personas, helping to uh, facilitate the field work. Uh, but my role is sort of to pinch it in there, but also to provide that qualitative and ethnographic fieldwork experience because I have many years of experience doing that variety of contexts. So that's what I bring to the table. But then, of course, other things happen. So we kind of, although we each have our expertise, we kind of overlap because we have to be able to communicate. So we end up kind of, I, people get a little more anthropological, I get a little more designerful, and, and they kind of we meet in the middle. The design is a strong background. We have uh, a few people. So some are, uh, uh, one is a product designer, so an engineer and a product designer. Another is a graphic designer. Uh, another is a prototype designer, a, uh, what we would call someone who's extremely good at doing uh, divergent thinking. So someone who uses creating services and products to sort of expand how you think about it. Uh, others, our backgrounds are in social work, 
uh, interior design, uh, visual communication and design. Um, we have a data scientist um, or, uh, who's experienced both qualitative and quantitative research coming from a military background where, where he worked before. So he provides that academic rigor on, on that perspective. Uh, and then, of course, myself, I provide the qualitative anthropological perspective. And so we all have different disciplines, and yet we find that after a while we start to talk and because of the nature of the work, we intersect. And sometimes some of us are more involved in some aspect because it's our area of expertise and other times others. But we always have a thing where, uh, maybe I'll explain that uh, when you get your next question, but we, we kind of pull together um, for a particular project and just to even bounce ideas off each other. So the roles kind of shift. It's a very flat kind of organization where we work in, in our um, I want to. I want. I don't want to say sector, but that's not what it is. It's our directive or something, um, and it's a very flat kind of structure. It's not a hierarchical structure, so it's anybody pinch hits to help make things come together. Today we were talking about we were working on a project uh, to look at settlement services for newcomers to Canada, and one of the two things that I pointed out is I said that first of all I said one of the things you need to do if you're bringing people through this process is that there are several stages where people just don't know what to do next. They're uncertain. They're basically in a liminal state to draw on Turner and Van Gennep. And of course, as you know, ritual processes, we use ritual as a technology to help people get through from one status to another to, to be separated and then be reintegrated into society. And if you create those touchstones for people, those periods of uncertainty are still going to be there but you feel less afraid because you have a way of integrating that way of thinking. And when I brought that into the table and they went, that's how we're going to, and they said, that helps us to connect the dots. And they got really excited. They said, that's why we hired an anthropologist. We like, and then that helped other people think about, and then we talk and then, so it really kind of blends into that. Uh, and they view the, my anthropological experience and my research experience as extremely valuable as they view everybody's experience. It's a very positive environment. Very positive. Uh, but how we work with them is typically we bring people in, we show them what we're doing, they get very excited, and then take it to the upper management. The IRCC has taken a very serious approach to using design and design research and other disciplines to help really change how they do things. And the organization really emphasizes that. They work on first-name basis with people, and they the things you develop, they bring right to the minister and things get implemented. So it's, it seems to be a very positive and forward-thinking environment. And to give you an example, when I started there, because we're on the 16th floor of a tower in downtown Ottawa, all of us, the workers, we all get the cubicles by the windows. All the management get windowless offices at the center. And they said, we do that on purpose because you're most important. That's the attitude they have. So for me, as, as an anthropologist, the first thing I went, very interesting. Obviously, there's a chain of command, and, and it, people have to sign off to authorize, you know, uh, research money and all that kind of thing. But they've really taken it seriously. So, from my perspective, in the few months that I've been there, it seems like they're very keen on engaging with people, listening seriously to ideas. In fact, they've even implemented um, a Blueprint 2020 plan where any employee can suggest things to um, improve services. And then the people who participate in our design challenges can then take those. They're the ones who get to evaluate it. And the senior management goes, well, if other people in the department think it's a good idea, not the top people, but the people that actually work with it, they'll endorse it. Well, what the design challenge is, what we do is because we don't just come in as consultants, basically, to come in and change how people do things. What we want to do, of course, and this is the approach that and, and there are one of the names we have for our division is the Client Experience um, Service Branch. Uh, but we also give it a shorthand of Pier 6, um, and, and we just use that name for now. Uh, but what it is is that our goal is to have culture change. So it's not just about, of course, helping to create better design, service design, but it's also helping people within the organization to do it. So what we do in the settlement in the design challenge, there's been two before. This one is on settlement design, dealing with how we deal with newcomers, including refugees and permanent residents in Canada, and how what problems they encounter. And so what they've done is they took from IRCC, they took from across the organization, from communications, from policy, and from other branches, and they pulled these people together, both from uh, the head office in Ottawa, the Windsor and Toronto offices, and Vancouver and Surrey offices as 
well and brought everyone together to do field work in Toronto, Kingston, and in Vancouver and Surrey in British Columbia. And in all those cases, to help people from these various parts of the organization to do field work, to interview service organizations, refugees, other newcomers, other people, organizations that work with newcomers to see what people really experience, what people find that works really well, and what doesn't work well. What helps them move forward in Canada, what holds them back. And that experience of a week of field work was very, very emotional and very powerful because many people heard very tough things, both about their government and about the people trying to make it in Canada. And that experience, pulling together as teams, where people who even were each other's bosses, nope, those titles are gone, we remove all that, and everyone works together. Then they come back, and in the second week, we do analysis, where we use the techniques like the KJ, KJ technique, and teach people how to analyze all that qualitative data that they recover from their notes. And then to think about uh, how to articulate the problems that they're seeing. And then now, in the fourth week, they're going to be working on creating prototypes that are solutions that then they can present to senior management and say, Here where we're, here's where things are falling down, and here's how we might do a better job. And the reason we do this is because those people who participate in the service design challenges, number one, they then become alumni. So they bring back their ideas, and they're the ones, when those 2020 blueprint ideas are promoted, they're the ones who get to evaluate them, because now they have design experience. They're also the ones who then bring back what they've learned to their various branches and directorates where people are eager to hear, and they bring back what they've learned. And the big thing is they learn that government can be changed. Policy and rules, they're all made up. They're important, but they're constructed, right? Like almost everything about human cultures is constructed, and it can be changed, and we can change it. Yes, it takes time, yes, it's difficult, but it can be done. And so what that does is that infuses this cultural change. It's a group of people at a time, but that helps to increase what they call buy-in, but also it helps to increase people seeing these are techniques that people use to help solve problems and that problems can be solved. And that's all part of this. So that's why, even though it's much harder to work with people who are not experienced, you have to train, you have to bring people in, it is very richly rewarding. Oh, I had I had a fair amount. Even though I had just started in May on the team, uh, I had a fair amount because the, one of the p members of our team, Norhan, she was taking the lead on creating our basically our what we call the design cookbook. But it was basically taking. You've probably seen the different types of techniques from like companies like IDEO and others talking about how to do design thinking and design design challenges. But we created our own. We took elements of it and then just explained it in a slightly clearer fashion. Um, and, and I was in charge of providing, of course, the ethnographic research component, so how to do, how to do take field notes, how to do semi-structured interviewing. Um, and, and all through the report, actually, all of us sat and we went through all of the things we were going to be doing in the challenge and said, okay, what do you think about this? Who do you think we should? So we had, each of us had a fair amount of input while respecting, of course, the need to have, you know, Toronto, Kingston, and Vancouver, and Surrey have to be the locations because that's where they had partnerships, you know, that kind of stuff. But I would say that uh, we had a fair amount of input. In fact, uh, I, w I, right off the bat, had some input right into writing those parts I mentioned, the semi-structured interviewing, and those parts that went right into our design manual that we've developed uh, to serve as a guide for future uh, design challenges. So right off the bat, there was some of that input. And again, since we've done it now, I've had some further suggestions. And so Ryan has said, yes, we're going to look at this again and go, how can we do it better next time? And again, we'll all have input into that. Right off the bat, it's um, setting up expectations because of the field work component, for example, setting up expectations of how many interviews you could put into a typical day. Uh, one of the things we found is that we put in a lot of material. Like, for example, in one day, we went from 8 in the morning until 10 at night because we were at an evening event with the LGBTQ community through what's called the 519 in Toronto that services refugees and newcomers who are LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, and it was a fantastic day. It was awesome. But everyone was... <laughs> Because it's a lot of field work, right? If you're going 12, 14 hours a day, paying attention and writing notes on what everybody's saying, and you know this from experience, you're done. You're beat. 
So in that week, we did a lot of contact. People were just constantly going. So that was a logistical thing, like figuring out how many people to speak to and how to connect them. Um, and that was a practical, that was something that we encountered. Number one, the first place where I saw it working was that when I saw people doing the field work, people were hearing experiences and some people, of course, were crying. They could feel it, they could see their own children, they could see their own things, and they could say, we, we can change this, we've got to change this, we've got to do something. That I saw as a success because, of course, as anthropologists, when we engage with people, yes, we have to sort of try to understand things and be a little bit dispatched, but we engage, we connect, we have to, we have to feel, otherwise we don't get it. Um, and they got it, they saw it, they feel it, they, t they felt it, they touched it, they were there, and even in a brief week, they got so much out of the experience that then they brought back, of course, with their respective experiences, and they started to think differently. The other time I saw them get it was when we went through all the analysis, but it was on the last day of the analysis, the, the, uh, the end of the third week, when they all acted out the scenario. So here's what it's like when a refugee comes and tries to deal with a service organization. Here's our IRC acts, and they acted out the roles of government and all those parts, and when they did that, they nailed it. They saw Everyone laughed, went oh, all at the same time. Like they saw and they connected the dots by acting out, by deliberately acting out what they were seeing. They explained things in a way that text just couldn't. They got it, and it was that moment when they started designing. It was that moment that I saw them going, "I think you got it," and we could see the connections. And so that that for me really made me say, "That's important. That's got to happen sooner next time." So, you know, and those, all those things, sort of, those were the two things that really helped me see the people kind of connecting the dots um, and also um, helped them to sort of start thinking differently. It changed them. And to watch how they're even now when we're talking to them now, because some of them are back at the main headquarters, they're not talking the same way. And they're starting to engage. And they're improving what they see and how they see it. So they stop thinking in rigid lines and they start realizing the fluidity of experience. They see the human, not just the policy. They really care, and they really want to help. A lot of the people do. So that spirit is there. It's just, I think, giving them the tools so they actually can help. Through the design challenge, um, in terms of ethics, we had uh, disclaimer forms for people that if they wanted to participate or not participate, they could stop at any time, that sort of thing. Um, uh, the only thing that we saw is, gee, I don't know, for an ethical, many of the people taking the notes, the people that participated in the design challenge, were very concerned. They said people came and told us their stories, and we have an obligation to honor their stories. And that's what we put at the forefront of this design, is when we create the personas and the archetypes, the sugar show, Here's someone who's a refugee, and we give them a name. It's not the actual person's name, but it's, it's an amalgamation of some of the things that these key people have. The quotes and the stories that they bring, we show. And everyone so far has been very pleased to see that when we're talking about this, when we're going to create a video and we're going to show management, we're going to show, here's what's going on. There will be those stories so that we're not missing anybody. We're not forgetting. We're ensuring that we catch everyone's story. Because we didn't offer money or anything to people, but we did think perhaps later, if we were going to engage and do this kind of work again, we want to make sure that we want to provide food and other things to people to thank them for sharing their stories with us. That I found is the, the little bit that line we have when we're applied. You know, unless we're working directly for the First Nation, sometimes we can worry, like, am I doing the right thing? So fortunately for me, though, I was never asked to do anything that was the wrong thing, if you will. So I wasn't asked to, like, testify against a First Nation or things like that. So for me, I felt, okay, I can resolve this conundrum because it's not severe, but it is something I thought, yeah, if you look at that with serious critical optics, that might be an issue. And I'm sure there are some anthropologists who would have an issue with the work I was doing because of that. The first thing I would tell them is, say, number one, I said, you're here because you love anthropology, right? I don't think people go into anthropology typically because they go, yeah, you know what, the benefits are awesome. They, they're going into it because they love the actual discipline. You're fascinated by people. You, you, so if you're there, already you're in the right place if that's what's motivating you. The second thing is figure out what you find interesting. Look at that. When it comes to being applied, though, 
one of the ways is simply by trying to engage with people. So getting to know people in general is probably how you'll break into an opportunity. Uh, I had someone that was reaching out to the Anthro Design Group and asked about advice on this sort of thing, and I reached out, and that person got to meet with a few people, a little bit of networking, because it really is something, it seems to be, that it's who you know. That's how you tend to break into doing applied anthropology, um, at least in my experience. So I think if someone wants to do applied anthropology, I guess my advice is, you know, do your schooling, work with people, work with a nonprofit, work in a government office, do all sorts of jobs, get life experience. When you do that, the opportunities will present themselves. But you have to get out and do things. So you can't just sit in the ivory tower and say, look, I'm going to go get a master's and then jobs will happen. You, you also need just to go out and work. Just, and it will come. There will be opportunities for you to connect with people. So that's the advice I would give. Be patient. 